Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I hope you're all doing well. The first thing that I need is to know that you can hear me. Uh, please, in the chat, let me know if you can hear me and hear me well. I'm using a new computer tonight. Uh, supposedly, it's supposed to be a little bit faster. Unfortunately, the fan is blowing so hard, it's starting to slow down. So hopefully, that fan noise uh, will not be a problem. Can everyone hear? Okay. Yes, loud and clear. Okay, I'm not using these headphone things because I'm not having a guest. Uh, last week we had a um, live stream. This week I'm having another live stream. In the future I'll begin having guests, and when I have guests, that's when I'll have to start using those things. Uh, my my wife actually has a uh, has a Bluetooth pair, and uh, the pair that I'm using now they have the little wire, and I'm not able to leave the desk and come use the whiteboard. So this is kind of nice once I do have those then I can be using those and then can be going back and forth to the whiteboard. So for those of you that know me, I'm Robert Breaker, and I'm going to start doing some live streams. I want to do it every Thursday. We might do some every other Thursday or things like that. I've already started to get some guests. Next week's guest will be Scotty Clark. So that'll be a blessing. Um, that'll be fun. Well, I, I've talked to him several times on the phone and man, Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. It's just fun to sharp, uh, sharpen iron with other Christians and he he comes up with some fun stuff, and it's just it's fun to talk to somebody who's who who likes to think and who likes to study the word. And so their mind is going as fast as mine, hundred miles a minute, because we're reading the word and we're going, "What about this? Well, what about this? What about this?" So that'll be fun. So we hope we'll we'll have fun with that next time. So last time we looked at dispensations. Now I don't want to go back there today and revisit that. Instead, I want to talk about this subject of church history. And so what I'm going to do. Since I don't have guests, I don't really have much time to read the chat. I'll try to read it. But uh, there's all this stuff that that I just got to get out there. Uh, sometimes a sermon in English and Spanish every week isn't enough. And then midweek service with our book of Acts, it just isn't enough. I just There's all this stuff that I just want to get out there. Um, I tell my wife, you know, your thoughts are like clouds. Unless you pin them down, they're gone. <laughs> So to me, it's like, get this stuff out there. And once I get it on the board and once I get it on the internet, it's like, whew, now I can rest. It's like, I can't get any rest until I you know, get this stuff out. And a lot of people have been asking about, Brother Breaker, what about church history? What are the true Christians? How, how long have there been Christians? Uh, is this denomination Christian? Is that denomination Christian? What, what is the true Christian throughout history? And, and they ask all these questions and it's like, okay, I know what I need to do. I need to talk about church history. So today, I'm going to use this as more of a teaching tool today. No guests today. And uh, we'll just be kind of like a teaching. I don't know how long it'll go, but I want to get out there as much as I can, church history, so you'll understand. And so you'll understand the format as well. Hold your questions to the very end. And I always put the at symbol and then Robert Breaker and then give your question. And then at the end, I can try to answer some questions. Um, I'm also learning too. For me, this is all about edifying. I want to edify people. I just, I just got to teach something. I want to feel like when I'm done that you guys can learn something. But I'm also understanding too that for a lot of people, this isn't just about learning, although that is great. It's about fellowship. So I understand that. And uh, it's a blessing to be able to fellowship, talking back and forth and chatting. Um, so this is also a great way that we can get together and fellowship. But for me, I just, I want to teach. God's called me to be a Bible teacher. And so today we're going to teach what the Bible says. We're going to look at the Bible. We're going to look at history. I love history. To me, history is so fun. So I'm more of a history buff. I love reading historical books. I just, I got to study history. I like it. So today we're going to look at church history. And I'm going to try to throw up here the last almost 2,000 years of the history of the world. This will be the rapture when it comes. And so all of this would be the church age. Okay, here's the, here's the time of the law. So we're going to look at church history today. This is the rapture. This, of course, would be uh, Armageddon. So this little area here, tribulation. This little area here, the millennial kingdom of Christ. Okay, I know it's not proportionate, but this would be the church age. Now, we're going to only focus in on the church age today. And so what I'm going to do is going to talk, and I hope with my back turned that you can hear me all right. I'm hoping that this uh, 
I'm hoping that this computer picks it up. Do you guys hear okay? When I'm turned backwards, let me know. Write a little note down there if you can hear okay. It should echo off the board so you can hear it. But today we're going to look at church history. Now there are a lot, and I mean a lot, of good books about church history. The old saying is the only thing that men never learn from history is that men never learn from history. And it's so sad today that they don't teach true history in schools. Uh, a lot of times they teach revisionist history. They've changed history and revised history, and, and they're not teaching the way that it really was. And when it comes to the history of the world and the history of the church for the last almost 2,000 years, people don't tell you what it was really like. Um, so I want to do that today. I want to try to give you an idea of what true history is. Um, Peter Ruckman wrote a good book. Actually, there's two volumes set of his books, The History of the New Testament Church by Peter Ruckman. And this was actually for our class when we took church history in Bible school. So, you know, I've got lots of notes and everything as I went through and had to read this for our class. So this is is, an, is a great source. You can go to the bookstore. Uh, their bookstore over there in Pensacola is kjv1611.org. And you can find Ruckman's books. And these are actually pretty good. His History of the New Testament Church, um, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And a lot of this stuff, Dr. Ruckman said, he got from reading Philip Schaff. Now, I don't know if you know who Philip Schaff is. S-C-H-A-F-F, -F, I believe. Philip Schaff was an old guy and 100 years ago about, something like that. He wrote, what, eight volumes? I'd have to look it up. But a lot of volumes of church history. A very studious man. And he wrote a lot about church history. And Dr. Ruckman said he used a lot of Philip Schaff's stuff as well. Uh, this is a book, The Trail of Blood by J.M. Carroll. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. It's also in Spanish, El Rastro de la Sangre. This book talks about church history, and I would um, I would ask you to get a copy of that. If you want to study more about church history, get you a copy of this book, The Trail of Blood. Fox's Book of Martyrs. I think... These books that I'm showing you can all be purchased from that bookstore. I don't get anything from it, but that's the only bookstore I know that sells them. Look online if you can, Amazon, anywhere you want to find these books. But uh, these are all great books about church history. Here's Fox's Book of Martyrs. Now, I don't know if you've ever read this, but this is all about church history and people that were true Christians that have been killed all throughout the history of the church. I've got an old book here. Got this from Dennis Denno. A Cross and Crown, very good book all about um, history. Uh, it talks about the Huguenots and the Valdois or the Valdenses and a lot of uh, good stuff in here. It's an interesting book about church history. Um, this is an interesting, well, I'll show you that one later. Uh, here's another one, this book here entitled The Faithful Baptist Witness by Dr. Phil Stringer. I don't know where you get this. Um, but uh, it's a good book, and it's also in Spanish, El Fiel, Bautista, El Fiel Testigo Bautista. And we're going to see, I'm an ordained Baptist minister. I don't say that much. Um, a lot of Baptists nowadays aren't what they should be. So I don't talk about Baptists that often. But today we're going to talk a little bit about it um, because I want you to know more about this. A lot of people don't even understand that the uh, United States of America is what it is today because of the Baptists in America. And uh, here's a very good book, America in Crimson Red, The Baptist History of America. Very good book about the Baptist and uh, a lot of the uh, founding fathers that started the United States of America. They saw the persecution of the Baptists. A lot of people don't know that. Most of America was Anglican, uh, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, and they the the Anglican church was the official church of the of the of England, and they literally persecuted Baptists because Baptists would not get a license to preach. Uh, one of my favorite authors is John Bunyan. John Bunyan was a man who lived in England, and John Bunyan was put in jail because he refused to take a license from the government to preach the gospel. And he wrote that book, Pilgrim's Progress, in jail. One of the greatest, they, they say to this day, one of the greatest pieces of literature that's ever been written is Pilgrim's Progress. It was written in jail by a Baptist who refused to take a license to preach, and he was put in jail by the, um, oh, I wasn't going to say secular authorities, but no, he was, he was put in jail because he didn't uh, accept the official state religion. And that's what we're going to see today. Church history, 
a lot of church history is the state joining with the church. Now, the United States of America is supposed to be separation of church and state. But the founding, the founding father said the separation of church and state was not to keep the state out of the church out of state affairs, but was to keep the state out of church affairs. The state is not supposed to get involved with Christian doctrine. But Christians are supposed to be involved in politics in, in because they're the moral background and backbone, and they're supposed to keep the, um, the politicians straight and moral. And I believe in America, a lot of uh, a lot of that has has been lost. A lot of politicians today are just evil and immoral and wicked. And it's because many churches say, oh, we don't need to talk about them. <laughs> what did John the Baptist do? Well, he he went over and he said, Herod, you're an adulterer. And what they do, cut his head off. But uh, he definitely got involved with uh, state affairs. So it's not wrong for the church to pray for politicians. It's not wrong for, for them to get involved in politics. They're supposed to. We all have a right to vote. We all should be engaged in trying to do what's right. Now, you can get more involved in that than you should. And I'm not endorsing that. Uh, I devote my time more to trying to win souls to Jesus Christ and tell people about the Lord and politics today. You know what politics is? They lie to you. They lie with you. They lie about you. <laughs> They're politics. You take the word politics, you divide it up. Poly means many and ticks are bloodsuckers. So politicians, what are they? They're a bunch of them and they're all a bunch of bloodsuckers. <laughs> so I try to stay away from politics, but according to the Bible, according to the founding fathers, I have a right to speak out against the evil that I see. So if I ever see any evil and such like that, I'm supposed to say something because they're supposed to be held accountable. Now, how do I get off on that subject? So today we're going to look at things like the Trail of Tears. Uh, we're going to look at Fox's Book of Martyrs. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail and, and go through these books and read. I'm just going to give you a basic overview of church history so that you'll understand. Because there's a lot of churches out there and they all claim to be Christian. But you need to always check the foundation. Where did they come from and what do they believe? So the first thing we need to do is go to our Bibles. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and read it off of the screen here since I already have it pulled up. And uh, the third, first thing I want to say is that there's what's called the body of Christ. And so the body of Christ is the church. And I'm going to show you real quick before we get into this study. And here's Jesus' blood. He shed his blood on the cross. That the Bible calls the church the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is called the church. Let's go to Colossians. If you have your Bible there with you, I hope you, you get it out. I am uh, only looking at my Bible here, so I'm not reading the, the comments. I always get excited to go back and read all the comments afterwards, usually. So this is just me speaking, but trying to educate and edify. Now, Colossians 1.18, look at what it says. Speaking about Jesus Christ, and it says, and he is the head of the body, comma, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. All right. So the Bible just said that the body is the church. Look again at verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So the Bible talks about the body of Christ and the body of Christ is the church. Now, what is the church? The church is all of those that are in Christ's body. How do we get into Christ's body? By faith. When we believe, we become part of the body of Christ. So the church is saved people. Now, what I'm going to show you today is church history, but I'm going to show you those that claim to be part of the church, and many of them were not saved. What makes you saved? Why, it's faith in the blood of Christ. It's the importance of understanding the atonement and accepting by faith what Jesus did for you. So the body of Christ, let's go to Ephesians 1, and I just want to get this preliminary out of the way to show you, because what we're going to see today is we're going to see the true line of the true body of Christ. Then we're going to see a false line, a line of people that claim to be Christians, but they are a false church. They are a fake church, and they're not truly the body of Christ. They're actually the devil's church. And I hate to say it that way, but that, I can't think of any other way to say it. Everything that God does... The devil imitates. The devil takes and, and, and makes a false thing that looks exactly like the original, but yet it's false and it's corrupt. So Ephesians 1.22 says, And have put all things under his feet. Who? Jesus. 
and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Verse 23, which is his body. So the body of Christ is the church. The church is the body of Christ. Those that are saved are a part of the body of Christ. Now, there's much more that I could go into. Well, maybe I should. Maybe we should look at this. Uh, some people today, and I didn't want to get too in detail into this part because I want to get more into the historical aspect. But what exactly is the body of Christ and who is in the body of Christ? Well, it's called the body of Christ. So it's Christ's body. Who's in the body of Christ? Well, Ephesians chapter 3. And... Uh, Verse 2, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I have wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of man, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Verse 6, Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of what? Of the same body and partakers of of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So I see the body of Christ made up of both Jews and Gentiles. So any Jew and any Gentile that gets saved is a part of the body of Christ. Uh, some people out there will say the body of Christ is only made up of Gentiles. And you say, oh, really? When did it start? And they say it started with Paul. And you say, really? So the body of Christ is only Gentiles? Yeah. Was Paul in the body of Christ? They say, yes, he was. You say, uh, okay, question. Who was Paul? He was a Jew. <laughs> so <laughs> there's no doubt that according to the Bible, the body of Christ is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. There are Jews, Paul was a Jew, and there were Gentiles in the body of Christ. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, uh, I don't want to get into this discussion of when did the body of Christ start. You know, some people say the body of Christ started at Pentecost. I'll just show you some verses, give you my idea on it. but. You know, some people just want to argue about things like this. So rather than argue, let's just agree that there is a body of Christ, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know anybody that will say, no, there's no such thing as the body of Christ. When it started, that's a completely different subject. But in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, look at what we read. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the what? Of the body of Christ. Who is in the body of Christ? Well, he mentions the apostles. All right. So the apostles were in the are in the body of Christ. What were they? They were Jews. We see Peter was a part of the body of Christ. We see Jesus here. So I believe the body of Christ started with Jesus Christ, and the apostles were the Jews that were in the body of Christ. And then later, through uh, Paul, we see people getting saved. And Jew and Gentile alike. I mean, Paul's going and, and winning Gentiles to the Lord, but he's getting Jews saved also. Let me show you 1 Corinthians as well. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Check this out. Yeah, I say this because there's some people out there to say, no, the body of Christ is only Gentiles. The early Jews, they're the little flock or, or something like that. And they said they weren't in the body of Christ. Oh, really? Really? 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, And God has sent some in the church, first apostles. What's the church? The body of Christ. So the Bible is telling us that the body of Christ, the church, started with the apostles, which means the apostles are a part of the body of Christ, the church. Do I need to continue reading there? No, I think that, that pretty much nailed it. So when did the church start? Well, this is my idea on it. I mean, you can think whatever you want, but I think it's called the body of Christ for, it's a, re for a reason. And uh, you go to Ephesians chapter 2, and, uh, well, I have 2.6. It's probably 2.16. I always leave that out. Yeah, Ephesians 2.16. Look at what it says. Ephesians 2.16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. All right, who are the both be? The Jew and the Gentile. The Jew and the Gentiles can get into the same body, the body of Christ, by faith. And it says that Jesus... Did what he did, what did he do? Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make it himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. So I see the blood of the cross being the thing that, that Jesus had to do. He had to die to make himself a body. And those that got saved, now you can debate, well, it didn't have anyone in it until, you know, Acts 2 or whatever. That, that's fine. But I believe that the apostles were a part of the body of Christ. Um, also, Ephesians, no, excuse me, Colossians 1.20. Let me show you this verse too, and then we can move on. I can get past this. Um, and this is the 
the fun part. <laughs> Already alienated some people, I'm sure. No, I hope not. But look at what it says in Colossians 1.20. Colossians 1.20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or in things in heaven. He made peace through the blood of his cross. So I see the blood as what's, what is so important, is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And his death started the uh, New Testament through the shedding of his blood. So it's through the cross. So I see the, the importance of the cross. So the body of Christ starts with Jesus, and it's his body. Now, after Jesus, we have the book of Acts. And the book of Acts talks about how after Jesus died and was buried and rose again, why he went to his apostles and he preached to his apostles. He told them what to go teach and what to preach. And what, did, what happened? The nation of Israel as a whole rejected their Messiah. So then comes Paul. Now, I don't have time to get into why Paul is in the Bible. But this is very important to understand the apostle Paul. The message of the Apostle Paul is one of the most important messages in the entire Bible. The message of Paul is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. This is what's called the gospel. Paul's message is that Christ died for our sins, but it's not just that Christ dies. It says how that Christ died for our sins. How did Christ die? He shed his blood. So it's through the blood of Christ that we have salvation. So it's all about how Jesus died. He had to shed his blood. Now, there's some things that Paul says that God revealed unto him that we need to understand. One of the greatest things that God revealed unto, unto Paul, the message of Paul. I just finished a message for this Sunday entitled Paul's Message. I can't wait. Well, I, just, I actually just uploaded, uploaded it a few hours ago. So if you get a chance later, watch this. It's called Paul's Message, and it will be the sermon for Sunday. But Acts, or, excuse me, not Acts, but uh Paul's message in Acts 13, yeah, Acts 13, look at that. Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39 is the very first time that we see the word justified in the New Testament. The book of Acts is an amazing book. I love the book of Acts. There's a lot in it. Um, it's a hard book. There's a lot of hard things, but it's not hard to get this message. The Apostle Paul says a three-point message in Acts 13. And that three-point message is the message that makes you saved. You're a true Christian if you believe this. All right? Now, why am I harping so hard on this? Because I'm going to show you false Christians. So I want you to see the true Christians. All right? Paul preached this. Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Now, I'm going to misspell the word through. Through Jesus is forgiveness of sins. No forgiveness of sins any other way. It's through Christ. What did Christ do? He shed his blood. So it's through the blood and the of Christ that we have forgiveness of sins. Now watch what he says in verse 39. And by him all that believe are justified. We are justified how? By faith. I use the term faith and believing interchangeably. Because, oh, it's the same word in Greek, but still it's the same understanding. You believe you, by faith, receive, you believe. So he says here, um, and by him all that believe are justified from all things. Now watch what he says, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So he says you cannot be justified, not by the law. So what is he saying? He's saying not of works. You cannot get saved by your works. The gospel of Paul is the gospel of salvation by grace through faith. It's not of works. We cannot get to heaven based upon what we do. We're saved when we trust what Jesus did for us. Now, this is so important because now we're going to look at the so-called church. There was always throughout history a true church and then a false church. And I'm going to show you the, the history of of the church. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> and all throughout Christianity, if you'll study, you'll find out that from the lines of the apostles to Paul, all the way to today, there have been people that carried forth this message of salvation by grace through faith, not of works. They've had different names all throughout history. In the early church, about 200 years after Jesus, they, they took the name Paulicians. 
and they called themselves Paulicians. Why would they call themselves Paulicians? Because they said, hey, we're following Paul. Why would they follow Paul? Because Paul says, be a follower of me as I am of Christ. And if you're following Paul, what does that mean? You're following his gospel. You're following his message. All right. They had other names. They had names like Waldenses. And there's all these names that were they were called Albigenses. Uh, they took the name Cathari. Uh, there's so many different names for them. I can't even remember. They, they were called Lollards. Um, I'm probably going to leave out some of the names that there were. There's so many of them. It's hard to remember them all. I had Here we go. In the back of the Trail of Blood book, they give you kind of a little map. And that little map there shows some of the names of the Christians that were the true Christians. And what were some of their names? Novations, Monetists, okay? Monetists. And some people say, well, they were heretics. Well, but they all had something in common. They were against water baptism, and they, they all said it's through this gospel of Paul. Um, let's see, Cathari, Waldenses, Albigensis, Arnoldists. There were some that called themselves Arnoldists, and, and other names like Henrikians. So there's always been, throughout the history of the church, People who have said to us the message of Paul is the correct message. As time went on, they were labeled Anabaptists by the Catholic Church. And eventually they dropped that and they just called themselves Baptists. And they could all trace themselves back to the early message of the Apostle Paul. Now, why is this so important? All right, if you know your history, and I hope you do, because they don't teach it in school anymore, unfortunately. But if you know history, there was a fellow named Constantine. Constantine was a Roman emperor. In 312 AD, 312 years after Jesus, he was about to fight a battle at Malvian Bridge. Malvian Bridge. And he says, but because he was a pagan, didn't believe in Jesus, he said that all of a sudden, the night before that famous battle of 312, he said, uh, guess what? I prayed to the God of the Christians and said, if you let me win and give me a sign, let me win this battle while I'll become a Christian. And he said he looked up in heaven and he said he saw this sign. Now, I don't know what sign he saw, but this is what they say he saw. All right. They say he looked up in heaven. He saw a sign that looked like this. Now, that sign to this day is an official Catholic symbol. And they say that that stands for XR, the first two Greek letters for Christos, which is Christ. So he says, I saw this sign in heaven, and I thought, wow, man, this sign. And, you know, I always wonder, was, was it the devil that showed him that sign, possibly? <laughs> but anyway, he says he saw this sign. He, he fought the battle, and he won, and he said, okay, now I'm going to become a Christian. And Constantine, when he became the big, big Roman Empire, the big deal, he started in 325 A.D. to mix Christianity. And so he mixed Rome and the Roman state with Christianity. And while he did that, being a pa pagan, he mixed in paganism as well. And in 325 A.D., he had what he called the Council of Nicaea, in which he called all these different uh, people together that claimed to be Christians. Many of them were already apostate. They had already mixed pagan with, with, with Christianity. We clearly see that in the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, John is writing in 96 A.D. to these uh, seven different churches in Asia. And he's like, you guys went into apostasy, many of them. They already had, had let the devil in one of the churches and things like that. So 325 A.D., he has started his own Roman church. It's a church-state setup. So it's a church-state religion. And so this guy, Constantine, set up a state religion, and guess what they called it? They called it the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the word Catholic means universal. 
And so what he was saying is, I want to start a universal religion. And I, since I prayed to that one God that, that was Christian and, and he believed in many gods, so he didn't even. Do you know that he never got saved? There's no testimony anywhere in the history of, of the life of Constantine that Constantine ever got saved. What there is, is there's a document, there's a historical record that when Constantine died, they went over to his bed body and they baptized him real quick and said, Shh, now he's saved. <laughs> no, we're not saved by water baptism. And we're certainly not saved by water baptism after you're dead. So this Constantine guy, he wasn't a Christian. There's no, no historical record that he ever trusted in the gospel of Paul. Rather, he started his own church. A church that I believe will be the church that the Antichrist uses in the tribulation because it's not the true church. So this is the, the beginning of what we call the today the Roman Catholic Church. Now, all throughout history, and that's what this book is about, the trail of blood and uh, Fox's Book of Marsh. All throughout history, we see two different lines of churches. We find those that claim to be the true church that could go all the way back to Paul and the early apostles. And then we find this church, the Catholic church, that says, no, we're the only true church, and you must come to us. And because it was a church-state religion, the state says, you either come to us or die. And the state said, these guys are heretics. These guys are dissenters. And all throughout this time, you have the Catholic church killing these people over doctrinal differences. You may or may not have heard of the Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was set up by the Catholic Church. And what did it do? It burned at the stake these people. Waldenses, Albigenses, Catholic. There was more religious war over the history. And the war was Catholics against people who claimed to be believers in Christ. The Holy Inquisition, La Santa Inquisition. And I don't have time to go through here. I would like to do a, a one of these. Um, live streams where we just talked about how evil the Inquisition was, how they tortured, how they burned at the stake, how they just did horrible things to people. The Catholic Church is a church full of murder. Here is an official Roman Catholic seal of the Inquisition, and it says it's a cross with a sword. And the Roman Catholic Church thought, you know, well, we're God's church, and the state's on our side, and unless you believe like we do, well, we have a right to go kill you. Does that sound like Jesus? Did Jesus say, and whosoever doth not agree with thy doctrine, murder in cold blood as thou choppest off their heads? No, no, Jesus never said that. So the Roman Catholic Church became a state-run religion. And its doctrine is not the doctrine of the Bible. Now, I don't have time to go through here to here. But I want to start about right here. And I'm going to show you something else. Around the 1400s, people began to look at the Catholic Church and they said, you know what? That's corrupt. It's not right to go around and murder people in cold blood. The priests are fornicating and they're doing bad things. And there was a guy named Martin Luther who came along. And Martin Luther came along in the 1500s. And Martin Luther started reading his Bible. And Martin Luther started reading the book of Romans. Now, why is that important? He, it was either Romans 5.1 or 5.9. I can't remember which of those two. But that's when, Rome, when he got saved. Now, let me show you in history. Let's pretend there's no religion up here right now. Let's look at secular history. They say in secular history that from 500 to 1500 were the Dark Ages. So about 500 to 1500, they called those the Dark Ages ages. Why were they the dark ages? Well, if you study history, you know what? Most people didn't even know how to read during that time because the Roman Catholic Church had taken over and had told people, you're not allowed to read the Bible. You can't have a Bible. You don't even know how to read. All you do is what we tell you or you'll go to hell. So this state-run religion put the whole world into the dark ages. It wasn't until the 14 or 1500s that we saw the Reformation. And the Reformation was this renaissance of learning. Why was the Reformation so great? I almost put it in Spanish, Reformation. Why was there a Reformation? Because some people started reading their Bibles and they started realizing, boy, are we dumb. 
we're not following the scriptures. We're following tradition. We're not following the Bible. So this guy, Martin Luther, reads his Bible and he says, oh, my. You know what he got a hold of, this Martin Luther fellow? He got a hold of Paul and Paul's preaching. And he read Romans 5.1 and Romans 5.9. And he got saved. He got saved through the message of Paul. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we, should, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 5 says, Much more than we are now justified by his blood. So this guy, Martin Luther, says, Hey, there's something that this Catholic church is missing. Justification. It's something that they're not teaching that they need to teach. And you said, you know what it is? It's this doctrine of justification. And he says, I'm going to start preaching this. I'm going to tar start telling people what Paul said. Because the Catholic Church had gotten away from the message of justification by faith. And when they did, they set up a state-run religion that had tradition all in it. And people were following tradition rather than the Bible. So it all goes back to Paul. When Martin Luther came out and said, I, we've been wrong, the church is corrupt, this, this Roman Catholic church, and, and, and they called themselves a church, the Catholic church, but it was full of lost people, not saved people. So when Martin Luther got this justification thing, he says, look, we, we've been missing it for, five, for a thousand years. The salvation of the soul is through faith in the blood. So justification by faith in the blood. So the message of Paul resurged again in the world. Now, people say, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, Mr. Breaker. What, are you saying that, that, that people were wrong for a thousand years and that no one had the gospel? No, I never said that. Look, there's this line of true Christians that tarried with the true gospel of Paul. But then there was a false church that got bigger than them and it persecuted them and it did not preach the gospel message. It preached what? Well, if you're a Roman Catholic, and I, if you are, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings by telling you this truth today, but you need to understand what the Roman Catholic Church teaches is tradition rather than scripture. Throughout these this thousand years of the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church burned people at the stake who tried to read the Bible. In the Council of Trent, the Pope says you cannot read the Bible. You cannot translate the Bible from the original languages into languages that people read. He said, more harm than good will come from letting the common man read the Bible. What a horrible thing. What does the Bible itself say? It says, the scriptures make us wise into salvation. So you've got throughout history, the true church, people that call themselves Paulicians, Novatians, Monetists, uh, Albigensis, uh, Waldensis, um, Arnoldus, the Lollards, Cathari, Anabaptist, Baptist, and they all stuck with the message, and they all said, no, you're saved by faith. So God has always had his true witness throughout history, but the devil made his church, and they began to teach the faith and works gospel, and they began to tell people it's by works. Well, this guy woke up, Martin Luther, and he says, no, no, you guys missed it. What did the Catholic Church do? They said, well, we need to kill this guy. So let's get him first and let's have him come before us at the Diet of Worms. And so he sat before a bunch of Catholic priests and they said, well, Martin Luther, are you going to recant of your teaching? Because that's not what our church teaches, that you're saved by faith. And he said, well, let me think about it. And he left. And uh, there was a famous, I, I can't remember, there's so many names in history, it's hard to keep up. But some famous uh, noble person took him and, and kept him safe and took him back in, in order for him to not be killed. Because he would have been burned at the Catholic by the Catholic Church at the stake for teaching this message. What is this message? The message that Paul preached in Acts chapter 13, justified by faith. So there has been a true church, and then there's been the false church. Now, this is where your Protestants come from. Martin Luther protested the Catholic Church because he saw much corruption. The Catholic Church was full of corruption. One of the things the Catholic Church did was they sold indulgences. An indulgence. And this is, this is crazy. But there were what's called indulgences. And what you could do, if you live back in this time under the Catholic Church, is you could go to your priest and you could say, Priest, I want to sin and I want to sin really bad. Now, priest, 
You say that our church gives us forgiveness of sins. So priest, how do I do this sin and get forgiveness of it? Because I want to go do it. Well, the Catholic Church says, well, I'll sell you a license. And, with, and, the, and the Pope said that's okay. They called it an indulgence. And I've seen pictures of them. You can look it up on YouTube and look it up. I mean, uh, people don't teach history nowadays, but you go to the Internet and find stuff. And they would, there were actually pieces of paper that were written out that says, I, so-and-so priest, do hereby grant a license to sin to such and such a person because he paid so much money. And you could pay a priest, and he would give you a license to go sin. All right, so you're looking over here at your neighbor's wife, and you're like, man, she's pretty. And you're a good Roman Catholic. I want to rape her so bad, but I don't want to go to hell. And the priest says, well, you know what? If you pay 50 pieces of silver, I'll write you an out an indulgence and you can just go do it. And then that paper says you're forgiven. And that's how sick and twisted and disgusting that church had become. They were literally licensing sin. And I find that offensive and disgusting. So what did Martin Luther do? On Halloween night at 15, oh, I forget the date, 1516, 1517, something like that. Um, no, it'd have to have been sooner. Uh, we just celebrated the four, 500 year of it. So 15 something, 1517, I don't remember. But Luther went to the All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany, and he took and he put his 95 thesis. What he did is he wrote 95 reasons why indulgences are evil immoral and wrong and he nailed that to the door of the church as his protest to the catholic church saying it is outright evil for you to sell pieces of paper that let somebody sin and then lie to them and tell them now you're saved even though you do that sin because you paid for it who paid for our sins jesus on the cross what are you doing saying that you look at this look at what peter says even peter says you can't get you can't get forgiveness of sin by money. Uh, first Peter, what did he say? First Peter chapter one, verse 18 and 19. The forgiveness of sins comes from paying the priest and he gives you a license to sin. No. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, for as much as you know that you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Um, but it, from your, but it says, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, you cannot be redeemed. You cannot get forgiveness by silver and gold or by tradition salvation is through the blood of the lamb we're justified through his blood the bible says so this guy martin luther said um um i can't go along with this teaching of this church anymore they have deviated from the message of paul they are so corrupt they're literally selling licenses to sin and so he said, I, I, I leave. And he did his 95 thesis. You can look all this up. This is all historically accurate. You can see it's true. And so when he did that, he said, I protest the Catholic Church. And other men at the same time started to see the sin within the Catholic Church. This is where the Protestants come from. So a lot of people left the Catholic Church in the 1500s, and they became their own line of Christians, and they were called Protestants. And what's sad is many of them, when they left the Catholic Church, they took some of the Catholic doctrine with them. This line up here, this line of the true church, never, ever baptized babies because that's not in the Bible. But the Catholic Church began to do the baptism of children, baptism of babies. Where did they get that from? Well, that came from paganism. That was a pagan practice. That wasn't from the Bible. And the reason that these people up here that believe the true gospel were called Anabaptists is because they refused to baptize their children. So they're Annie, which means anti. So the Catholic Church says, oh, those bunch of Anabaptists that don't baptize their children are just evil. No, they were like, you show me a verse in the Bible that says to baptize my kid and I'll do it. There's no baptism in the Bible of children. So many people left the Catholic Church and became Protestants. Okay, but look over here. These Anabaptists, they eventually said, we don't want the name Annie anymore. We're just going to call ourselves Baptists. Why would they call themselves Baptists? Because they said, we go around and we immerse people through immersion, only people that are saved. You see, a child doesn't have a chance to, to say yes or no. The Catholic Church makes you take a little tiny baby in and they baptize them. Do you think that baby had a choice? What if that little child didn't want to be Catholic? Too bad. <laughs> 
They do it against his will. And so the Baptist said, no, you don't get baptized in the water till after you get saved. So they began to call themselves Baptists. So here is church history. The true line of Christians, always being followers of Paul. The false line of Christianity, the Catholic Church, the state-run religion that fell into tradition and began to teach false doctrine and became so corrupt, it was literally licensing sin. Not only did they say, pay us money to give you an indulgence to sin, they would say, um, when your loved one dies, he goes to purgatory. There's no purgatory in the Bible. It's either heaven or hell. But the Catholic Church taught, well, so what you need to do is you need to pay us to do the Mass. And if you'll pay us enough money, why then the soul of your loved one will leave hell and go to heaven. There was a famous uh, Catholic priest named Tetzel. Uh, Tetzel, I believe it was. And he would go around and he'd say, when your money hits the clinks and makes the clink noise in the bottom of this, why your loved one is free from hell. So put your money here. Put your money here. Oh, here you go. And deceiving these poor people into thinking, oh, my mom finally went to heaven and she's not suffering. That is sick. That is disgusting. That is that is horrible. That's satanic to deceive people by not telling them the true gospel and making them think that after they die, then you can save them through different things. So this line here is the false line. I'm going to show you some of their beliefs and how they're false according to the Bible here in a minute. But the Protestants left the Catholic Church in the 1500s. Here we are in the 2000s. And guess what? Many of the Catholics, uh, excuse me, many of the Protestants are doing this number right here. They're going right back into the Catholic Church. There's a church called the Lutheran Church. They claim to be Lutherans, followers of Luther. They signed an accord with Rome and said, now we're all Catholic again. We're going back into the Catholic Church. Oh, so you're going back into the corrupt church? If you would just stop and think about it for a minute, why Luther left the church, it was because that's a corrupt church. You say, Robert Breaker, you're bashing Catholics. Am I? Have you watched the news lately? How the Catholic Church came out and said, we got a problem. A lot of our priests are pedophiles and they're molesting children. And it's all over the news. Priest after priest after priest is going to jail for molesting kids. Why would they do that? There's a problem with that church because it doesn't have the doctrine of the Bible. We're to follow the scriptures. And there's always been a true church that has followed the scriptures all the way out here to the rapture. Uh, people ask me, Brother Breaker, what denomination are you? Well, I am an independent Baptist. I don't like to tell people that because I'd rather say I'm a King James Bible believer. <laughs> but I was ordained as an independent Baptist. So I'm connected to the line of the Baptists. But even Baptists are becoming apostate nowadays. There's some Baptists that have now joined with Rome. So truly, we are in the last days. Truly, we're in this time of apostasy. And we're really seeing a lot of apostasy. And it's really sad. So we must be very close to the rapture. But I want you to see this. I hope you understand this. The true line of the true church, those that are really saved. Then you have the false line of a false church. And out of that church came some Protestants. And many of those Protestants that left the Catholic Church, they accepted justification by faith. They were saved. But the Protestants today have so little doctrinal teaching that a lot of them are just joining back right into the Catholic Church. And it's very, very sad. Now, what are some of the things the Catholic Church teaches? Well, for many years, the Catholic Church taught, don't ever read your Bible. What we say is what you need to know. Follow tradition. Well, what does the Bible say about that? Let's go to Mark chapter 7 and verse 13. What does the Bible say? In Mark chapter 7 and verse 13, the Bible tells us, watch out for tradition. The traditions of man are not what God said. We're supposed to go by the Bible. And Jesus says in Mark 7, 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered and many like things you do. Jesus warns us and says, watch out for tradition. Don't follow a man-made tradition. Follow the scriptures. In the Catholic Church, there are what's called priests. And in the Catholic Church, go to Matthew 23, 9. The Catholic Church says, whenever you see a Catholic priest, you go up to him and you say, Father. And you say, Father? Now, wait a minute. Are there priests today? No. The priests were back here under the law. 
Jesus Christ is the high priest who died on the cross for our sins. We don't have priests today. And this line of the true church never had priests. The Catholic Church says, well, priests can't ever get married. They have to be single and celibate. Paul says, now, if you're a, a minister or a bishop or an elder, you have to have one wife. <laughs> it's like everything the Bible says that these people believed, this false church says, no, don't believe that. Because our tradition says the opposite. Who are you going to follow? I'm not going to follow that false church. Matthew 23, 9, Jesus Christ is speaking, and the context is of religion and titles given to religious people. And look what Jesus says in Matthew 23, 9, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So Jesus says, don't ever, ever go to some man in a religion and call him father. And yet this church, the false line of church, what does it tell you to do? Come to the priest and say, oh, father, <laughs> exact opposite of what the Bible says. I find that troubling and sad. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 and 5. Now, I do realize this is Old Testament, but uh, this is a great thing. Jesus told the Jews this, and uh, it shows you that God doesn't want people to do this. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 and 5. Look at what the Bible says. All right, so what's wrong with this church? It has priests. And we don't need priests today. And not only are there priests in this religion, they are single. And the Bible says you're supposed to get married. And they say, call me father. How can you be a father if you're not married and don't have any kids? And they say, call me father. It's bad because it has tradition. It's also bad because this church, the Roman Catholic Church, has images or icons, they call them. I call them idols. And the Bible says we're not supposed to have any graven images. You go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in the earth beneath or is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, verse 5, nor serve them, for I the Lord am God and thy God am a jealous God, visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate. God says you hate God if you make an image and you worship it. And those are idols. Well, the Catholic Church says we don't worship idols. We just worship images. Yeah, that's exactly why God said not to make is a graven image. And you say, we don't worship them. Yeah, you do. You go into that church and you bow down before them. And God says, don't do that. I've been inside Catholic churches. Everywhere you look, graven images. There would be no Catholic Church without all the images that exist within the Roman Catholic Church. Now, Let's look at what Jesus says, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. Matthew 6, 7. If you look at the Catholic Church and you look at the Bible, you're like, how can anybody be Catholic? Because everything they do is the exact opposite of what Jesus said to do. In the Catholic Church, they have a thing they call the rosary. And they say, pray the rosary, pray the rosary. Oh, the rosary is so wonderful, the mysteries or whatever they call it. Go pray the rosary. And you say, what's that? Well, you repeat the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, you do what now? What does Jesus say? Matthew 6, 7. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. The rosary is repeating the same words over and over and over. What does Jesus call that? A vain repetition. That's something that the heathen do. Is the rosary in the Bible? No. That would have come from paganism when it mixed with Christianity and it came from Rome and, it, and, it, and it, it mixed into that state religion some horrible things. Let's go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter uh, 10. All right. Another thing that the Catholic Church does is they celebrate what they call the mass. Oh, excuse me. Let me make sure I say that right. The mass. That's right. They call it a mass. And if you ask them what it is, they say it's a sacrifice of Jesus. Now, I've had people try to tell me, Brother Breaker, I'm a Catholic and you're a liar. The Mass isn't a sacrifice. Don't you give me that garbage. My cousin died. I went to Kansas. I did not know he was a Roman Catholic. I went to his funeral. It was in a Catholic church. And they did a Mass. And that man, that priest said, and this is us sacrificing Jesus again. He literally said, I'm killing Jesus. Now, what does the Bible say about that? Did Jesus die more than once? 
Should we go killing Jesus and sacrificing him over and over again? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 10, look at what the Bible says. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Look at verse 9, I mean uh, 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and often offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after that he offered one sacrifice forever, sat down on the right hand of God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross was once for all. And that the one sacrifice of Jesus is what saves us. The Catholic Church says, no, no, we sacrifice Jesus. We kill him over and over in the Mass. And they say, we do it. And you go to the Catholic Church and you say, well, what's the Mass for? They say, uh, for the forgiveness of sins. So if you'll pay us money, well, we'll do a Mass for your lost loved one, and it'll forgive his sins. Oh, you've got a mass for the forgiveness of sins. And what does the Bible say? Never take away sins. Right there, Hebrews 10, 11, which can never take away sins. You getting where I'm going with this? Every doctrine that the Catholic Church teaches seems to be contrary to the true doctrine of Scripture. How could anyone get so far away from the teachings of Christ and Paul and the early apostles? What is that church? It's a state-run religion that mixed Christianity with paganism and set up its own traditions outside of the Bible. That's why I'm not a Roman Catholic. That's why I can never be a Roman Catholic. I can't accept something that's against the Scriptures. I'm up here on this line. I'm not going to fall down into this line. Another one, confession. You go to the Catholic Church and you go to confession. And uh, you say, oh, priest, forgive me for I have sinned. I did this, this, this. And you confess to a Catholic priest. And guess what he'll tell you? He'll tell you, well, I can absolve your sins if you'll confess them to me. Can he really? Can a man forgive the sins of another man? No. You say, Brother Breaker, I'm Catholic and they don't teach that. Uh, uh, no, yes, they do. Don't you tell me. I was in Guadalajara, Mexico last year. Walked inside the Catholic cathedral in Guadalajara, Mexico, and right there in front of my face was a confessional booth. And it said in Spanish, come in here, confess your sins, and leave forgiven. What were they saying? That if you confess your sins to that priest, he will forgive you your sins. Now, what does the Bible say? Can a man forgive sins? Luke 5.21, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which blas speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? <laughs> Even the ancient Pharisees were smarter than most people. They're like, man can't forgive another man of his sins. What? What are you, crazy? So the Catholic Church is not the true church from the true line. It, in fact, what does the Catholic Church say? The Catholic Church says, no, we weren't started in 325 AD. Well, we started with Peter. And they built themselves a big cathedral called St. Peter's. Okay, so you say you're you're Peter, and they say that Peter was the first pope. See, they take their religious leader and they call himself a pope. You know what else they call him? The pontifice. You know what pontifice comes from? Babylon. That was the chief name for their evil uh, religious leader, the pontifice. Pontifice Maximus, the pontiff, coming from Babylon, coming from the false religion, mixing with Christianity. But what does the Bible say about Peter? They say Peter was the first pope. What did Jesus say about Peter? I mean, <laughs> yeah. all right. If, if Peter is the first pope, we have a big problem. They say that when Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 16, they say that Jesus says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And they say that when Jesus, standing here, is talking to Peter, they say, they say Jesus is saying, you're Peter and you're the rock and I'm building my church on you, Peter. Well, we know that's not true because we're told in the Bible that the rock is Christ. So what Jesus is saying is, you're Peter, but upon this rock, me, because I'm the rock, Christ, I'll build my church. But the Catholic Church says, no, the church is built on Peter. He's our first pope. Well, that doesn't uh, fare too well because in Matthew chapter 16, Verse 18, right after he says that, look at verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Jesus Christ called the first pope, if you believe the Catholic doctrine, Satan. 
Boy, what a doctrinal blunder. He said, hey, first pope, you're Satan and you hate me. What a horrible thing. I mean, every time, every time you look at Catholic doctrine and you look at the Bible, you just shake your head and say, what's wrong with this church? Why is it so against God and the Bible and the teachings of Paul? Why is it so full of hate and wanting to kill people and burning millions at the stake for only believing in the blood of Christ? You see, the Catholic Church doesn't believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. They believe in the blood and the cup. And the Catholic Church is all about a cup. And when you go into the Catholic Church, it's a cup of wine. Paul calls it a cup of devils. You go into the Catholic Church, and what do you do? You say, um, let's do the Mass, and, and I want to drink some blood. That sounds like a cannibal. Why would you go drinking blood? That doesn't. And they say, well, Jesus said, take eat. This is my body. Yeah, but it wasn't alcohol. They're literally drinking alcohol, and then they're saying, but that's blood Jesus. No, it's not. No, it's not. So there's so many things wrong with the Catholic Church. I, I don't want to be a part of it. Catholicism is a false Christianity. It's another Jesus, another gospel, another blood, another sacrifice, another teaching besides the truth. All right. Why did I teach this? Because a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people think that if you say you're a Christian, then you're saved. And that everybody in the world that says they're a Christian is a Christian and they're saved and they're part of the body of Christ. Is that true? No. Only those who have by faith accepted the work of Christ, his shed blood, are truly saved and they're part of the true church. There are false churches out there. The Catholic Church does not preach the true message of salvation. So it's a false line. It's a false church. There are Protestants that came out of the Catholic Church. And for 100, 200, 300, 400 years, they did preach the truth. They still took with them some of the false tradition of, of the tradition of the Catholic Church, but now they're going back. And also, out of this line, I didn't even have time to put this up here, but toward the end, out of this line, in the last 200 years, there's been some people that have come out and started false denominations, the Seventh-day Adventists, the, this church and that church. And these. And so there's been a lot of sects come out of Christianity, um, Seventh-day uh, Witnesses, uh, Mormons, uh, different ones that have departed from the true gospel of salvation alone by faith in the blood. And what is the false church? The false church will be left behind at the rapture. Those who are saved, the true line of Christians will go at the rapture. Those that are false Christians will be left behind. And they will probably accept the Antichrist because the Bible says that the Antichrist has a false prophet who goes and deceives the world and everybody accepts that. So they accept the political regime of the Antichrist, but they also accept the religion of the Antichrist. And many of those will be this false church. So there's your church history. I do not know how to make it any simpler. You say, what are you, Robert Breaker? Well, I'm just saved. Now, I personally belong to the independent Baptist denomination, I guess. Again, I don't really like to call myself that because they call themselves independent. My name is not in some roll book somewhere. How did the independent Baptists come about? Well, that'd be a different one. We'll talk about that later. But for, for many years, the Baptists were the ones that were closest to the scripture. Of all the different denominations in the world, if a guy said he's a Baptist, you'd be like, oh, well, I know one thing about you. You probably believe the Bible. You probably read it every day. Um, what's interesting is my third great grandfather was a Baptist preacher. His name, Jacob Manley Canty Breaker. He lived from 1824 to 1894. He was a pretty famous dude. I think it kind of looked like him. I might favor him a little bit. I don't uh, When I was younger, I did. And uh, he was pretty well known. Uh, I've got here the Baptist Encyclopedia. Two volumes of Cathar, what is it? Cathcart's Baptist Encyclopedia. And uh, these are all just different names of different Baptists. And uh, I think it's quite interesting. You go over here to page... 131, and you got, whoa, look at that, my third great-grandfather, Reverend J.M.C. Breaker. And I don't have time to get into him, but he was a Baptist, and he was an interesting fella. But I'm not a Baptist because of tradition. I'm not a Baptist because my great-granddaddy and my great-granddaddy and my great-granddaddy great great was a Baptist. And I'm not saved because my great-great-great-granddaddy was a Baptist. In fact, his son, and then maybe his son were saved. But I think that when a couple generations were, they weren't saved. I had no idea that I had a great, great, great granddaddy that was a, a saved man who preached the gospel. I had no idea. 
I thought that was interesting. I had to actually find all this stuff about that. But that's what I wanted to throw out there for you. I wanted you to get a hold of this because this is an important thing to understand. When you get a hold of church history, you understand that there's the true body of believers in Christ and there is a false church. And it's been like that through history. And the false church is the Catholic church. It's Mary worship. It worships Mary rather than Jesus. It's made up of, of uh, brujos sacerdotes. It, it's, it's, they do witchcraft. They practice witchcraft. And the Vatican is all tied into Dagon and the false gods. And there's all these, the Inquisition, they're murdering people. It's, it's been a church that Satan has been using. And I wish I had time to go into more about that. So there we go. In one hour, all of church history summed up in a nutshell. A true church of true believers throughout history. And then this false church that Satan started through a secular man who started a state church, state-run church, and how they persecuted and killed so many people. The Inquisition was horrible. The Inquisition started in Spain in about the 1400s. And they called it the Holy Inquisition because to them it was so holy to go kill people. I guess I'll have to abbreviate it since I don't have room for it. And thank God, I mean, I'm not a lover of Martin Luther or a follower of Martin Luther, but thank God there were people like Martin Luther and John Huss and, and John Wycliffe and people that said, no, we're not going to obey this church. This church says we cannot read the Bible. I'm going to translate it into English, Tyndale said. Or was it Wycliffe? Yeah. And, and other men stood up and says, no, no, I will not go along with this false church. But the church is, oh, but look how ancient we are. While we say we go all back, all the way back to Peter, while you're bucking 1,500 years of tradition if you go against us. Oh, you mean 1,500 years of corruption and being wrong? This is what it all boils down to. Either the Pope and that church is right or God is right. Jesus said, by your fruit, you shall know them. All right. I have a Bible. I read my Bible and I follow what Jesus said and Paul said and the apostles said. I'm a follower of Paul. Romans through Philemon. I'm going to go by that because that gets me to heaven. If I follow the Catholic Church, do I go to heaven? This is what's so sad to me. The Catholic Church does not tell you how to get to heaven. You go to any Catholic Church and you go up to the priest and you say, Priest, I don't want to go to hell. Tell me how to get to heaven. Well, if you come here and get confirmed and get baptized and you come to the Mass every week, and you confess your sins, and you do this and that and the other thing, then I can guarantee you one thing. What is that, Mr. Priest? What is it? That when you die, you'll go to purgatory instead of hell. I'm sorry, Mr. Priest. What now? The priest will say, well, when you die, you'll go to purgatory instead of hell. You say, what is purgatory? Well, it's flames where you burn. It's what? He say, how do I get out of purgatory? Well, once you're down there burning for a long time, if people do enough masses, and say enough rosaries for you, then they'll they'll get you out. Does that sound like a happy message to you? When you die, you're going to burn either way? That's not what the Bible teaches, and that's not what this line teaches. This line teaches what Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Saved by faith, given eternal life, and when you die, your soul goes to heaven through faith in the blood of Christ. So, yes, I may sound a little dogmatic about this. I might, I might get a little riled up and, and loud, but it's because this is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of heaven or hell. There are many souls deceived in this false religion. And when they die, they won't go to heaven. And the worst part is when they die and they wake up in flames, they think, oh, thank God, I'm going to get out of here eventually. And they never will. They're deceived while they're alive and they're deceived while they're burning thinking that they'll get out when they never will. So people say, Brother Breaker, are you against Catholicism? You know why? Because Catholicism against, is against God and the Bible and against Paul and against the gospel. Paul said that salvation is justification by faith. Martin Luther saw that and got out. These people preached it throughout history. I'm going to preach what the Bible says. I don't need the Pope. And then, see, I didn't even get time to go into the Pope. The Pope in Rome is nothing more than the emperor of the empire state of, of Rome. He's not a religious man. The Pope has a hat. There's a hat that the Pope has that kind of looks funny. 
And it, it kind of looks like this, and it's supposed to be like a crown or something. And, and the Pope's hat, somewhere down here, there's there's these Latin words. Uh, uh, how does it go? Vicarius Filidi. All right? That means Vicar of Christ. And on his hat, it says Vicar of Christ in Roman numerals. I mean, in, in Latin. But in Latin, we have what's called Roman numerals. And you take the letters, Vicars of Christ, Vicario Filidi, D. And you count them up, and guess how, what that comes out to in Roman numerals? Six, six, six. You can't make this stuff up. What does the Bible say about the Antichrist? Well, he has on his forehead the name of blasphemies. He's blasphemy. Vicar of Christ means in place of Christ. The Pope is literally telling the world, I am here in the place of Jesus. I am Jesus here on earth. And you look at that in the Latin language, and you say, no, what are those numbers? Wow, you've got 666 on your forehead, Mr. Pope. So I would say, get out of the Catholic Church. Don't stay in it. I'm not attacking the Catholic Church. I'm just teaching history. I'm not going to stand up and say bad things about the Catholics. There are people in the Catholic Church, and I care about them. So I want to tell them the truth about how to be saved. I want you to see what Martin Luther saw. I want you to read the Bible for yourself and see what Paul says. But if you're in the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church says, no, don't read the Bible. I've been to many Catholic homes in Honduras. I go into that home and they're Catholics. They're sweet people, nice, friendly folks. They feed me sometimes. I say, can I talk to you about what the Bible says? I got my Bible here. I'd like to share some verses with you. And they say, no, sir. I say, well, well why can't I show you what God said? Do you believe the Bible is God's word? Yes. Would you like to know what God says? Yes. Okay, let me share this with you. No. I say, why can I not tell you what the Bible says? They say, because my priest said that I can't understand it without him. And that only he can interpret what the Bible says. So I'm not allowed. I'm prohibited, according to my priest, to read the Bible. You know what the Pope said about the King James Bible? When the King James Bible came out, the Pope, you know what he said? He said, that's your Protestant Pope. He said, that's your paper Pope. <laughs> he said, you bunch of crazy Protestants. You think you can listen to that. You listen to me, is what the Pope said. I am the authority on earth. Don't you go to a book. And yet, what does the Bible say itself? Study to show thyself approved unto God. Workman needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Read, study, follow what the scriptures say. The Bible says the word of God is able to make you wise unto salvation. The Catholic Church says don't read it. I lived in Honduras for seven years as a missionary. I went all over Honduras and Guatemala and those countries down there and studied history. And I loved going into the libraries and the capital cities and, and reading. You know what happened in the 1800s? Missionaries would come into Guatemala and places like that and bring Bibles and give them to people and say, we want you free. We want you to know how to be saved. Read this Bible. And they'd pass out Bibles. And when they walk away, the Catholic priest would come over and take every Bible and then burn it right there in the streets. What is this hatred toward the Bible and the Word of God? Why does this line of so-called church hate God and His Word so much? It's only through the Bible that we can come to the gospel and the knowledge of salvation. If you take away the gospel and the Bible, you're leaving people what? Lost. And if they're lost, where do they go? To H-E double hockey sticks. So, is this an important message? Is this something we should talk about? Yeah. Because your immortal soul depends on whether or not you know what God says. And if you know your Bible, then you know that this message that Martin Luther got is the true message. Because he didn't get it from man. He didn't get it from tradition. He didn't get it from the pagan Roman Catholic state set up church. He got it from Paul. And Paul got it from Jesus Christ. Okay, I'll kind of move a little bit. Someone can take a screenshot later if they want this. It's all right there. I'll try to look through here and find out about uh, questions if we have some questions. I don't want to go too much longer on this. Now, another question is moderators. I have no idea what you people have been saying. None. In the future, I'll try to have some moderators because, man, people could have said anything they wanted on here. I don't care. But uh, it's nice to have some moderators. But I will try my best to do a couple of questions if I can. And I just want you to know what the Bible says. 
because I care about you and I want to see you saved. And that's what it's all about is salvation. The message of salvation is through the word of God, the Bible. The message of salvation is not from a corrupt church that licenses people to sin. That's not the way of salvation. From a false church where the head of the church has 666 on his forehead and preaches the exact opposite of what the Bible says. Salvation is through the word of God, not through tradition. Don't go by what some man says. Go by what the Bible says. All right, let me see here if I can go through and find a couple of questions. I don't want to go too much longer because I'm literally burning up in here. It's so hot. Um, some people are asking questions. And let's see. And look, I don't want to come across as attacking Catholicism. But sometimes you have to stand up and tell the truth. So if people say Robert Breaker is a hater of Catholics, you're wrong. And if you say Robert Breaker attacks Catholicism, you're wrong. All I've done is told the truth. And sometimes the truth hurts. Paul says, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I just want you to know the truth. Well, amen and stuff. Let's continue here. I'll scroll down quickly. Remember, if you have a question, put at Robert Breaker, spell my name, and then ask your question. Um, yes, I do need some moderators. Um, so far, I don't see any questions. Uh, maybe I went through that too fast. I don't know. But if you have some questions, I would be happy to answer those now. Is the Talmud, the Torah, or something like that? I don't have time to get into that now. Uh, someone says, Robert Breaker, are you a Muslim? No. You know what's funny? Islam came out of this church, the Catholic Church. So from the Catholic Church came Islam. And I don't have time to get into where Islam came from, but you can go to Chick Tracks, and they have some really good um, information about that. Matter of fact, let me show you that. I think I bought these not too long ago. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with Chick, but uh, Chick Tracks has a lot of good information about the truth about the Catholic Church. And uh, these come from Chick Tracks. Now, you can go to chick.com, C-H-I-C-K.com, and you can find a lot of Christian literature. I don't really like their plan of salvation at the end. I don't like it when they tell you, ask Jesus in your heart and stuff like that. But they have some good information. This is called the the comic book series that's full of, of historical stuff. Alberto is part one. Double Cross, part two. This is a lot of the, this is the history of the Catholic Church. Let's see. The Godfather is part three. I don't know if you've ever seen these. If not, you need to get these. These I used to read when I was a teenager. These are some good reading, good history about uh, history. The Four Horsemen, uh, the Prophet. Now, this one tells you about how the Catholic Church helped to start the Islamic religion. And what's interesting is Islam is now joining back into the Catholic Church. All these different denominations are coming back to the Catholic Church so that when they, they, they don't go at the rapture, they're all going to have the one world religion. So it's good to be to be saved. This one is called The Prophet and talks about where Islam comes from. Uh, this is a new one. I don't know if I've oh, got two of them. If I've read this yet, it's called The Jesuits. The Jesuits are very bad, very evil, very wicked. If you want to read something that just blows your mind, look up on YouTube The Jesuit Oath. So, or YouTube on the Internet. And The Jesuit Oath is horrible. The Jesuit Oath is they swear to kill anyone who's against the Catholic Church. So I'm not a Jesuit, nor do I want to be. Um, so am I, am I a Muslim? I am not. Islam doesn't have the gospel. Islam doesn't believe in the true salvation. They are followers of Allah, and Allah is Satan. I don't know any other way to say it. You can go to WorldNetDaily, WND.com. Somewhere on that website, they have an article that they wrote several years ago in which they found a historical uh, a clay thing with writing on it, and uh, it's 1700 before Christ. And it says, Allah is the God who rebelled against the true God. He is the God of violence. Well, I look at my Bible, and the only person I know that rebelled against the true God and is the God of violence is Satan. So Satan is Allah. So what are those people that follow Allah? Well, they're Satan worshipers. That's kind of sad. Oh, let's see here. Any more questions? Are the seven churches going through the tribulation? I don't have time to talk about the seven churches. If you will, I have a YouTube video entitled The Seven Churches. And I talk about how the seven churches are churches in Asia. And they're under the preaching of John. And it looks like to me that seven churches kind of applies more to the tribulation. Yeah, there's a way to spiritually apply the seven churches to the church age. But 
it really appears like the seven churches are seven churches in that time. And you can watch that video and learn about the different ways to read that prophecy to the seven churches. Um, where do the Anglicans fit in? That's a good question. Someone asked, where are the Anglicans? Well, around this time of the 1500s in England, there was a man named uh, King Henry, King Henry VIII, if I remember right. And he was married to a woman and the Pope said, well, you're stuck. And he says, I don't want her. I want to marry someone else. And the Pope says, sorry. He says, then on you, Pope, I'm leaving the, your church. And he started his own church and it was called the Church of England. And Anglicans, uh, I think, are the Reformed Church of England, if I remember correctly. I'd have to look that up. But Anglican Church somehow ties in with the Church of England, which was a Protestant church. And so they became Protestant and they took with them some of the teachings of Catholicism. But yet they tried to get closer to the Bible. Um, don't think that Protestants are lost. A lot of Protestants were saved. Thank God. But they never left completely out of the Catholic Church. That's the problem. Um, uh, continuing here, I like answering questions. This is fun. When I was in uh, high school, actually elementary, uh, no, uh, middle school, one of my teachers said, smart people ask questions. I always like that. Can you clarify James 2? Not right now. We'll look at that some other time. James chapter 2. I've done several videos on that. Huh. Do bugs come from hell? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like it when they're biting me, those blood sucking. But no, they are they probably came from the fall. Adam and Eve fell. Um, someone says slow mode is off. Well, I turned on the slow mode for the chat. So I'm sorry if it's going too fast. I did turn off the slow mode. At least I thought I did. Are you backing up your YouTube channel in case YouTube takes down Bible teaching, teaching channels? Yes. Every video that I put up on YouTube, I put on Vimeo. So get familiar with Vimeo, and you can watch my videos on Vimeo as well. Um, can you do a live video like this again, but doing a prophecy timeline from past to present? Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, someone says, pray ye worthy to escape. Now, see, that's Jesus talking to the Jews. We will never be worthy in our flesh. The only way I'm worthy is when I trust Christ as my Savior. Then I'm imputed his righteousness. Now I'm worthy in his eyes, but it's not because of my righteousness that I'm worthy. It's because I have his righteousness. So I don't get, I don't pray to be worthy. I'm saved. And I thank God for his justification. Um, did the Kabbalah doctrine come from Babylon when Jews were prisoners? I believe it did. I don't have time to talk about the Kabbalah. But here's an interesting thing. Every Thing eventually falls into apostasy. There's several dispensations in the Bible, seven at least. And in each dispensation, the people always end up in apostasy. And then God says, okay, now we're going to do this. So where does the Kabbalah come from? It's Babylonian doctrine, and the Jews accepted that. And I don't believe in the Kabbalah, and I don't have time to talk about what the Kabbalah is today. Is John Calvin saved? That's a good question. <laughs> John Calvin was a big name Protestant was very anti-Catholic, but he wasn't very Christian because he did the same thing that the Catholics did. He burned people at the stake. Now, I've got his two-volume set of Calvin's Institutes, the big, huge books that he wrote, wrote, and he does repeat the gospel over and over and over. So at least he knew what it was. Now, did he believe it? I don't know. What I see John Calvin did as a Protestant, he kept some of the teaching of the Catholic Church. He tried to get closer to the Bible, tried to get this doctrine of salvation by faith, but he still set up a state religion. And John Calvin uh, became the head of Geneva, Switzerland. And he took uh, the Old Testament law and tried to force it into his uh, governing of Geneva. And so he would burn people at the stake. And that wasn't right. So uh, was he safe? He might have been, but he was really messed up because he started by taking this as his foundation and then mo moving to the Bible. He should have just thrown out everything and went to the Bible alone. Um, let's see. Do animals have souls? I don't have time to get that. Um, let's see. My father became a Ro Roman Catholic a few weeks ago because he saw some Roman Catholic church history video. God must really be pulling the strings to you do a video on church history. Look, get these things. Send them to your father. They're not that expensive. Get these. Send them out. Say, Dad, I want you to know the truth about the Roman Catholic Church. And these are so easy to read because they're like in comic book form, you know, and yet they're historical facts. And so these are really good. So this is what I do when someone's Catholic. I try to give them those first. 
Someone says, is it a sin to get cremated? It's not. I wouldn't do it personally. But if you're saved, your soul is saved. The body, who cares? God's going to resurrect the body. And if it's cremated, he knows where every atom went, whether it went up in smoke or if it's in ashes. So, Did the early church fathers believe in eternal security? Well, Paul taught it. So I guess so. He was one of the church fathers. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Now, during the time of, of Paul, after Paul, before 325 AD, there were some church fathers that fell into apostasy. But there were also some good Christians, too. Um, can you clear? Let's see. Where do I go for fellowship? That's a good question. Here's a good place. Um, I, I tell people to go to fundamental.org. Now, I don't know these people, but if you go to, and I'll type it in here, fundamental.org, whoever's website that is, he puts a list of all over the world churches that claim to be King James Bible believing churches. Many of them are independent Baptist churches. Now, I do not know if they're good independent Baptist churches or bad independent churches. But if someone contacts me and says, Brother Breaker, I want to go to church and I can't find a good church. That's the only place I know to go to. I say, look up fundamental.org, find a church that's close to you, and then go, go discern it. Go find if it's a good church that really preaches the truth. And oftentimes, unfortunately, they're not. Oftentimes, there's, it's really hard to find a good church. But a lot of people need fellowship, and they're looking for other Christians to fellowship with. And that's what church is for. Um, so, you know, how much is too much? You know, some churches don't preach right. Well, how much can you put up with? As long as they've got the gospel right and they're King James, and they may be off on some other doctrine, I can still put up with that and go and fellowship with them. I might not like what they teach if it's not right, but I can still love them in the Lord, try to get them right. And if they don't, well, I'll go find another church. When was the Reformation? Well, the Reformation started in the early 1400s and around the 1500s. So the Reformation was around the 1400s. What is the right church to join? Well, that's a good question. Um, at one time, the Independent Baptist Church was the one closest to the Scriptures. And some are still holding fast to the truth, and some are apostatizing. So you have to look and see. Um, thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Um, Galatians, I don't have time to get into Galatians. I want to stay on topic here if we can. Um, is marijuana a sin? Marijuana is a plant. So I assume you're asking, is it sin to smoke marijuana? Well, I don't, I don't want to smoke it. Uh, in the Bible, it talks about the last days people are, um, are doing evil things. And, uh, I think they're the word that it's using in the Greek language is pharmacia, pharmacia where we get our word pharmacy, drugs. And um, so the people fall into this spiritual deception based upon their doing drugs. And marijuana is, is a drug. And when you smoke that, it is an entrance to the spirit world. So I would caution people and say, hey, don't smoke marijuana because you're opening yourself up to the spiritual world and to spiritual attack. Uh, we don't need to be in the spiritual world until we go to heaven. So I would not do marijuana myself. Do you think that after the rapture, Protestant churches will still exist and people will believe the lie there? Yes, of course. Uh, a lot of churches will still exist and there will still be people in those churches that are lost. You see, those are the local churches. Those that are saved are part of the body of Christ, the church. Now, those people that are saved, they come together and they, they build a, a church building, perhaps, in, in their area. And they call that a church. But not everybody in a church building is saved. So when the rapture comes, there will be a lot of churches still left behind with a lot of people still in them because they've never trusted the gospel of salvation by faith in the blood. And will they exist in the tribulation? Yeah. And many of them will be deceived and they'll fall into the false church. Those that don't will have to flee from the Antichrist and have their heads chopped off for not taking the mark of the beast or will have to somehow endure to the end. And good luck with that when you can't buy or sell and you have to live that long without being able to buy and sell. Um, let's see. Anything else? Someone says, is the 1611 King James Bible a good version? It's the only version. And I don't have time to get into that now, but I've recently uploaded uh, one of the live streams that I did on Max Bauer's channel in which we talk about Bible versions. I also have, and so go there and I show why the King James is the right one. I also have several other videos on YouTube about the King James Bible. It comes from the correct text, the true text that these people copied and followed. 
All other versions besides the King James come from these corrupt Catholic texts from this line, this church. Why would I want to go to a corrupt church with corrupt teachings and ask them to give me a Bible? I'm going to stick with the true Christians that suffered and bled and died and suffered persecution from the Catholic church and get a Bible from them. And that's what the King James is. It's the true word of God from the true line of text that the true Christians held on to. Um, let's see here. So, yes, the King James 1611 authorized version is God's word. And uh, what we have today is the 1700 whatever edition of the King James. But it's God's word. People might ask, well, where do I get a 1611 Bible? Sure enough, there's the next question. Where do I get a 1611? I tell people to go to this place to get a King James Bible. Uh, go to local church Bible publishers.com. Now, there's a lot of other places you can go, but they have some of the best nicely printed King James, all shapes, sizes, and it's King James only. And they're very affordable. Why does the Catholic Church believe that Mary was immaculately conceived? Good question. Pagans had their false god, and the false god of the pagans was who? The paganist religion was believing in Isis, Horus, and Seb, IHS. <laughs> That's why the Catholic Church loves to have IHS. But who is that? That's Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. So the trinity, if you will, of the Catholic Church is a father and a mother and a son. And so in order for the Catholic Church to continue with their pagan roots, well, they would have to exalt a woman to godhood. And that's pretty much what the Catholic Church does to Mary. They call Mary the mother of God. What does that mean? That she, she's literally a godmother. She's, she's a woman that's a god. And they said she's so much like God that she was immaculately conceived like Jesus. So she was conceived without sin. How do we know that's not true? Well, Mary says of her own lips that she rejoices and magnifies in God her Savior. Who needs a Savior? A sinner. And Mary said she was a sinner. Matter of fact, she offered sacrifice after she gave birth to Jesus as the law commands that a sinner do and that a woman is unclean and stuff like that. So Mary was not immaculately conceived. That's, that's a lie. Will babies die and go to hell for taking the mark unwillingly? That's a good question. I don't know how to answer that. Um, tribulation's only seven years, and you would think that they'd still be young enough that they wouldn't reach the age of accountability, but then again, who knows? The Bible does talk about a generation that is uh, of children that are that are accursed. So I don't know. Maybe that's who it's talking about. I, that's a good question. Does Revelation twenty two nineteen 19 apply to the church age today? Those that take away from the words of this prophecy, should God shall take away their part from the book of life. Well, once you're saved, you're always saved. That's what the Bible says. So I've seen people, though, that have translated different versions of the Bible, and they aren't saved. And it comes out later that they were homosexuals or that they were liars, that they were Satanists, that they were this, that, or the other. The people that use the NIV Bible, they have no idea. Mollencott, a woman, helped translate the NIV, and she said, I'm a lesbian. Another guy came out and said, I'm a homosexual. Another guy came out and said, so these people that are putting out new versions of the Bible that are taking away from God's word, changing what the King James says, uh, I don't see them very much as saved man. There was one man that worked on a new version of the Bible, and after he put that out, he repented. And he went out and tried to tell everybody, I was wrong. I should not have translated the King James that, bad, that way. So you think a saved man, the Holy Spirit would touch his heart and tell him, look, this, that's not right. And I wish I could remember what Bible that was and who that man was. I'm sorry. I wish I could remember that. Someone says division between Paul and early apostles. I don't have time to get in that. Where? Um, let's see. Good questions. Good questions. Um, maybe I can get done here in a second. Are we going to have children in the millennium? That's a good question. I don't see why. We'll get a glorified body. And um, the Bible says, you know, we, we never, we neither marry nor given her in marriage in heaven. So I don't believe we're going to have kids in the millennium. When we get our glorified body at the rapture, that's it. Uh, let's see. Boy, I'm seeing a lot more here. A lot more questions. Okay. So I'm trying to get down here slowly. Uh, we're going to make it. Uh, okay. 
More questions. What do you think about the Jerusalem Bible and the Geneva Bible? That's a good question. Um, the King James is very close to the Geneva Bible, but the Geneva Bible was put out by Puritans, who were Protestants, and they were Calvinists. They're followers of John Calvin. And the Geneva Bible has so many notes. And there are some places in the Geneva Bible where they translated it to be more in line with their doctrine. So I do not use the Geneva Bible. Uh, I use the King James Bible. Uh, I don't know about, yeah, the Jerusalem Bible, I don't use it. I don't know what it is in English, but the Jerusalem Bible in Spanish comes directly from the critical text, the Catholic text. So I don't use the Jerusalem Bible. Did I see where all those Baptist leaders met with the Pope? Yes, I did. There are many, many Baptists that have gone into apostasy that are no longer sticking with the truth. They're more or less Protestants because they've come over closer to the Catholic Church. And sadly, there's many Baptists today that are joining the Catholic Church. That's why I say independent Baptists, because many independent Baptists won't do that. But even some independent Baptists are becoming apostate. That's why we must be close to the rapture, because those that at one time would say, we'll never compromise, are now compromised and are beginning to turn away from the truth. What is a good way for us to contact you regarding further biblical conversation and questions? Well, you go to my website, thecloudchurch.org, and on that website has the email address, and you can email me. Mary is not God. We are all, um, Jesus is not God. No one is God. We are all God. We are all the children of God. Yeah, right. Whatever. Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. We are not gods. That's a crazy thing to say. Uh, let's see. Is the book of Enoch legitimate? I wish I could go into that, but I won't. I uh, don't have time to talk about that. All I know is that it's quoted in scripture. But when I read the book of Enoch, I looked at about four or five places in that book where I said, nope, someone has messed with this book and someone has changed that to sound like Catholic doctrine. So it sounds like to me that some Catholics sometime back when uh, messed with that book. And so we can't know for sure what parts of Enoch have been messed with and what parts have not. So we cannot take it as part of the canon, as part of our um, inspired, uh, preserved books. Somehow someone messed with it, so we can't take it. But it does have some inter interesting stuff in it. Um, question, is homosexuality a sin? Please tell me. I am right. Um, no, you aren't right if you're in favor of homosexuality. Homosexuality is an abomination, God said. You go back to Leviticus, I believe it's chapter 18. God says it's an abomination for a man to lie with a man or a woman with a woman. So it is a very vile, it's a very wicked thing. It's something that God never created man or woman to do. Now, I do not want to get into what homosexuality is, but sodomy is a very dirty thing. Need I say more? You are literally soiling yourself in that act. And if you do that, you know that you feel bad when you do it. You feel dirty and you feel sinful and you feel wicked and you say, I wish I wasn't dirty. So yes, it is sin. And deep down, you know it's sin. And God said it is sin. It's something that we should never do. I thank God that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sins. You can be saved if you're a homosexual, but you need to get away from that and never do it again. It's not something that God wants people to do. And in fact, when people do that, they go so far into sin that oftentimes they become reprobate and they never, ever have a desire to come to Jesus and get saved. They enjoy their sin. And there are places in the Old Testament where God had to kill people for that sin because they became so reprobate and so evil and hardened their heart so much that God said, oh, that person is never going to get saved. Now, I don't teach that if you're a homosexual, you can't get saved. I think the blood of Jesus is so powerful that it can forgive any sin and save any sinner. But I will say this. I've seen very few homosexuals get saved. So don't be homosexual and don't do that. And I say that out of love. OK, you may not believe that, but I say that out of love, because if you look at the statistics Homosexual people live an average of 20 or 30 years less, less than straight people. So not only is it dirty, not only is it an abomination, not only is it a sin, it's a lifestyle that will, will cut your life short. And I don't want you to live a short life. I want to see you, you know, get saved. I want you to live a, a fruitful life. And don't do things that are harmful to yourself and would cut your life down and, and, and shorten your lifespan. Is it bad that I'm refusing fellowship with a backslider? He claims to be a Christian Catholic, but hates when I tell him what Jesus commands us not to do. He mocks me for my stance. No, it's not bad to refuse fellowship. The Bible says that we're supposed to separate from other people, uh, especially, I mean, if he's Catholic, he's probably not saved, sadly. So 
he's not a brother in Christ. But uh, the Bible says to separate from all those that walk disorderly, brothers that walk disorderly. So, no, there comes a time when you have to separate from people that aren't doing right, aren't living right, and don't want right. And you try your best, and you keep thinking, well, if I keep being their friend, then I'll help them. Most of the time, they'll drag you down. So rather than you going down to their level, and you're thinking the whole time, I'm going to bring them up here, before you know it, you're down there with them. So sometimes there's a time when we need to separate. And you got to separate from evil. The Bible says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And the Bible tells us not to be partakers of other men's sins, but to keep ourselves pure. So there's a time when we need to, 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 to withdraw fellowship from others. Um, someone asks, if the Lord doesn't come this year or in the next couple of years, what do you think? When is the latest year our Lord and Savior might come? Well, that's a good question. And I don't think you could go any farther past 2033 if our calendar's right. Because Jesus died in 33 AD, and Isaiah talks about after two days, God goes back to dealing with Israel after 2,000 years. So I don't see how it could be any later than 2033. I really don't. Now, our calendar is 350, uh, no, 365 and a quarter. The Jews' calendar is 360. So you figure that out. You know, we're, we're pretty close to the 2,000 years if it's the Jewish calendar. If God's going by the Gentile calendar, then... So I don't know, but I it's I'm not looking at the Gentile calendar. I'm looking at the number of years that Israel became a nation. And we're in the 70th year of them as a nation. And we have that pattern in the Old Testament of God after 70 years. So I'm, I'm people say, don't say finger crossed, but I'm praying and hoping that this is the year that the rapture comes. If not, OK, there's a lot more to do for the Lord. And I don't know his plan. All I know is he said he would come back and he said after two. So maybe it'll be later on in the future, but sure looks like it'd be a great time for Jesus to come because everything seems to be in place. They're supposed to be announcing a peace deal here in this month or the next month, and it just seems like so many things falling in place. So even so, come, Lord Jesus. Someone asked, is it okay to want to go on a suicide mission and kill all gay people in the world? I think that's a silly question. I think you know the answer. Number one, you shouldn't go kill people, and number two, you shouldn't do a suicide mission. That's not a good way to think as a Christian. As a Christian, we don't think about how can we go kill people. We should think about what can we do to get people saved. This is the line of those that always wanted to kill. The Catholic Church killed people. We shouldn't think about how do I go kill people. We should think about how do I reach people with the gospel and teach them how to be saved. Uh, someone says, my family makes me go to Catholic masses and I can't stand it. What should I do? Well, if you're young, you have to obey your parents, unfortunately. But you don't have to accept that false religion, that false teaching. If I were you, I'd take my Bible. And if I was forced to go to a Catholic Mass, I would read my Bible while they're doing the Mass. And if my mom or dad says, don't do that, I'd say, but mom, aren't we in church? <laughs> I mean, so I would, uh, I would do my best to uh, stay out of that. But if you're too young, if you're under 18 and your parents are making you go, well, then get your Bible. Uh, take notes. And use what you're learning there in the future to be able to tell why they're wrong. Because now you know the Catholic Church is wrong. Um, what do I think about the Illuminati? I don't have time to go into that. Maybe someday we'll talk about the Illuminati founded in 1776 by Adam Weishaupt. And the plan is they're hell-bent on world domination. So they're working for Satan. They want to bring in a one-world order, new world order. They want to bring in a one-world government and a one-world religion. And they basically want to set up for the Antichrist his kingdom. So I think the Illuminati is evil. What do I think of the grammatical version of 1611 to today's English? I think that's silly. I think that the English that we have from the King James 1611 has become the standard English even to this day. The King James Bible made English what it is today. And we should stick with that beautiful English language. Is Islam going to be a part of the end times? I do believe it will be, because in the end times, in the tribulation, they're chopping off people's heads that don't take the mark of the beast. Islam is the only religion in the world that goes around with a sword and chops people's head off to this day. So I think it'll be Islam that's, that takes over, hijacks Christianity, and uh, in the tribulation will be chopping off people's heads. Does the Bible teach a geocentric flat earth? I'm not going to go there. Not time to talk about that. Is watching movies a sin? It depends. If it's an evil, wicked, ungodly movie, yeah. If it's a documentary and you're learning something and there's nothing bad in it um, and you're discerning, you're actually being edified from it. I don't see how watching a movie is any different than reading a book. 
Uh, a lot of people watch just for entertainment. I don't want to just be entertained. I don't want to be amused. The word amused is a compound word. A uh, means not, and muse means to think. You know, in the old days, they'd say, I'm going to muse upon this. I'm going to think about this. Well, so being amused or being entertained is just sitting there so you don't think. I like to think. I like to be edified. So if I watch a movie or if I watch a documentary, I love to watch documentaries, it's so I can learn something from it, not just so I can go, bruh, 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 feed me something stupid so I don't have to think. No, I want to learn. So if I watch a movie, I discern it. And I try to make sure I don't watch movies that have evil and wicked. Hollywood has an agenda. And when Hollywood makes a movie, it's not for entertainment. It's to warp your brain into thinking the way that they want you to think. And uh, boy, someday we'll talk about that, I think. Um, because my wife and I, we've noticed that for years. We talk with people and they say, have you seen this new movie? That was awesome. We're like, um, you thought that was good? All right. Out of curiosity, we watched it. And this is what we saw. They're trying to think, make you think that this is okay. And this is a, and it's an agenda propagandist film to try to propagandize you to believe this against the Bible. And we tell that to Christians. And a lot of times Christians go, well, I didn't think of that. No, no you were just sitting there to, to be amused and to entertain yourself. Watch out. What they're trying to do is what? Program you. If you watch TV, what is it called? It's TV program. There's a reason it's called programming. They want to program your brain to accept what they're bringing in the future. So don't just watch TV or movies. Try to stay away from them as much as you can. But if you have to watch them, discern them. Here's what my wife always thought was a good idea. If we ever let our kids watch a movie, we have to have them afterwards do like a you know, two or 300 page paper on what was it about and what did the people that put that out want to make you believe and how is that against God in the Bible? Well, what a great assignment because now it's a, it's a classroom study. How do you do witnessing? What do I tell them? Well, I have a video on how to win souls to Christ. Check that out on YouTube if you would. Uh, do you believe people in chop? people's heads off. I don't know. I don't get that big question. I lost it. I don't know where it went. But do you believe in chopping people's heads off if they are sinners? <laughs> uh, no, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where I'm supposed to go chop somebody's head off if they're a sinner. Uh, so as a Christian, I don't go kill people. Now, if there's a war, in war, war is hell. War is killing people. So in war, you have to uh, kill people to defend yourself. Uh, someone breaks in your house, you defend yourself. But just for the fear, mere pleasure of go chopping off somebody's head because they're a sinner? No, I'm not. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a Muslim. I don't believe in killing people because they don't agree with the way I believe what the Bible says. Uh, roach and centipede in home. What does that mean? My old church says all movies are evil. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I hope you go into what the Bible teaches about our earth. Okay. Uh, be interesting to have a study sometime on the hollow earth. That's kind of a neat, a neat one. I have to wrap it up here in a second. Um, got so many. Is it okay to listen to Christian rock or Christian metal? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Uh, rock and roll is slang for fornication. The term rock and roll comes from they get in the back seat of a car and they roll around and they rock on top of each other as they as they commit the act of fornication. So the word rock is a dirty word. And so how you could say Christian rock to me, that just doesn't sound right. Um, metal, heavy metal. That doesn't sound right either. I think those are not very Christian uh, melodies or sounds that come from that. Uh, no hide laws. I don't want to get into the no hide laws. Um, I can't explain Revelation right now. When we're in heaven, will we, we understand and talk different languages? Probably. We'll have the mind of Christ, so we'll probably know every language there ever was. Uh, what is your position on the UN? Do you believe it, it will usher in, probably says usher, it left out the H, usher in the new world order? Yeah. I believe the United Nations is the devil's um, main tool to bring in the, the one world government. And that's basically what the United Nations is. It's going to be the one world government. And I think that the uh, Antichrist, when he comes on the scene, he will probably be the head of the United Nations. Um, do you accept Bitcoin? Yeah, you go to my website, thecloudchurch.org, and you could send some Bitcoin um, somehow. And there's somewhere on that website, I think I buried it way down on the bottom on how to donate to me because 
It's not about the money. It's about trying to help people. But if you do want to donate, you look through the website, thecloudchurch.org, and find where you can donate. And there's a way you can donate via Bitcoin. What is your favorite Bible verse? Romans 3.25. And uh, that's the verse I got saved reading. And uh, 1 Samuel 12.24 is a good verse for how to live your life and what we need to do. What do I think of sleep paralysis? I don't. I like to sleep. I don't know much about what sleep paralysis is, so I have to look into that. Um, how long will you be streaming? As soon as, they, as I can get off, I want to. I'm getting kind of hot in this office. Um, I like your preaching and your style. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I just try to tell the truth, and I try to do it as nicely as I can. <laughs> um, sometimes I get a little riled up, maybe like I did today, because... I just don't want to see people deceived. It bothers me to see people deceived with false doctrine. I want them to get right. Um, someone asked, will I have a glass of wine with them in heaven? Well, I don't think there'll be fermented liquor. Uh, a lot of times the Bible talks about wine, new wine, which is grape juice. So if you want to drink some grape juice together, sure. But I try to stay away from the fermented type. Uh, do you have a video on Believer's Two Natures? I think I do. Um, I just don't know what it's called. I'd have to look. I think one's called, um, oh, let's see. Can a Christian sin? Question mark. And then I have some other ones about that. But yes, the two natures. Someone says, you're the man. No, I'm not. The Bible says the man, Christ Jesus. The man is Jesus Christ. I'm just a man. Amen. And Jesus, he's the man. And he's also God manifest in the flesh. So will you have kids on the new earth too? No. Um, do you verse by verse on the book of James? It's interesting you say that. My old website is rrb3.com, rrb3.com. And on there, I have my commentary on the book of James. It's a written commentary. I have a commentary on James and first and second Peter. And you can either read that for free on that website or you can buy the book either way. Do I know who the vigilant Christian is on YouTube? I do not. I think I've heard that name before, but I have no idea who that is. Um, let's see. Have you heard of Trey Smith? I have not. Why did the Catholic Church kill the Knights Templar? Good question. The Knights Templar were an organization within the Catholic Church and that went and killed people. I didn't even get into the Crusades um, and how they had their religious wars. But the Knights Templar became too rich and the Catholic Church got angry and they didn't want that. And so they they turned against them. It was all about power all about money, all about riches. It wasn't about the spiritual things and the gospel with the Catholic Church. So they turned on the Templars because they wanted their money. Yes, amen. Um, let's see. So I appreciate that. Thanks for your teachings. Well, thank you. Um, such a blessing. Amen. Um, Someone says about the video on UFOs. That was an interesting one. Uh, people say they like watching me and they like watching Gene Kim. Um, I've watched some of Gene Kim's. I do not know him. I did contact Gene Kim a while back because someone said they got saved watching my videos and, and Gene Kim's video. So I sent an email to Gene Kim and said, hey, Gene, here's somebody got saved from you and me preaching to him. I thought this might be a blessing. Never heard anything back. So if I do, great. If I don't. The other day, I went down to the bookstore, Pensacola Bible Institute, where I went to Bible school, and they had a, a little thing here, Pensacola Bible Institute, and these are um, the graduates of the Pensacola Bible Institute, and uh, here's my graduate. I graduated in 1998, and you can see there's my name. Uh, it's funny because there's some guy out there that hates Robert Breaker, and he says, Robert Breaker never graduated from the Pensacola Bible Institute. It's like, okay, well, here I am as one of the alumni, and, and here's our class picture, and Maybe you can see me right here. <laughs> I was very, very young. And uh, yeah, so I thought that was interesting. And uh, someone had told me that Gene Kim went to the Pentecostal Bible Institute. I did not know that. Uh, a lot of people that watch me say they watch Gene, Gene Kim as well. And so I looked through here and I found his picture as well. I won't show you, but um, that's where I went to Bible school. And we were very blessed to have Peter Ruckman as our Bible teacher because he knows a lot of Bible. And he was a very learned man, and he would always say, it's all what the Bible says. Go by that. And so I'm thankful to have gone to school there and learned the truth. People say, would you agree with Ruckman with everything? No, probably 90%. Uh, but uh, 
you know, you're never going to agree with everybody on everything. So I think it's funny that people think, you know, unless you agree 100 percent, you can't be friends. Yes, you can. And you can get along with each other. You just got to make sure you believe right on salvation, the scriptures and sanctification, living a holy life, living for the Lord. You got to believe correctly and have the right doctrine. You might not agree on everything, but if you believe on the, the most important things, then you can be friends. Amen. What do I think of the New King James Bible and the Berean Bible? I've never heard of the Berean Bible, but the New King James Bible has problems. I bought something from the bookstore the other day. Maybe eventually I'll make a video on why the New King James is wrong. What is 666? I don't have time to talk in about 666, but it's called the number of the man, and it's called the number of beasts. So it's the number of man, it's the number of the beast or the Antichrist. And um, is it sin to stay home in Bible study rather than go out and job search? Well, Bible says you're supposed to work by the sweat of your brow. So right now. <laughs> so yes, you should. If you're able to work, you should be working. Try to make some money. Um, if you have a family, especially. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. So you should. Now, it's good to read your Bible, and you should, but you also need to get a job and work if you are able to do so. Um, can you please do a video on Revelation? We'll see. Do you eat pork? Mm. I'm not really a big fan of pork, except for bacon. Oh, bacon is good. And sometimes in breakfast, a nice piece of ham. And now let me tell you why I can eat that. The Apostle Paul says, pray and eat. And he says, um, you know, it's not wrong. Any creature, if it be with prayer and thanksgiving, can be received. So according to the Apostle Paul, you can eat that. Uh, Peter, God appears to Peter and told Peter, kill and eat. These things that God said under the law, you're not supposed to eat. Now you can eat. So it's not sin to eat meat. I have a video on YouTube about that and how it's not sin to eat meat. So look that up. Um, someone asked, although we cannot lose our salvation, can we permanently lose closeness and fellowship with God? And does God get angry with saved Christians? Well, yes, you can sin and backslide and become so unrepentant in the sense that you just don't care and you don't want to do right. The Bible says there's a sin unto death. Now, I don't know what it is. I've never figured out. But I guess I assume that you could get so far into sin as a Christian that God says, well, just let them die. <laughs> I'd hate to go that far. Uh, but you can also be a cold-hearted, mean-spirited uh, Christian who is truly saved, but is just so far in the flesh and carnal that you're just no, no good to anybody. And that shouldn't happen. And usually the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So if you're saved and you're living openly in sin, watch out. God is watching and he is going to chastise you somehow. And you'll go through some things and God will do that to you because he loves you. He's chastising you because he loves you and he'll make you want to do right and live right. Can you do a video on why the Church of Christ isn't right? I've talked a lot about the Church of Christ. They believe that you're saved by water baptism. And as we're going through the book of Acts now, verse by verse, and you can find that on my, my uh, website, thecloudchurch.org, uh, I show clearly how water baptism does not save us, but they think it does. So if you'll watch our Acts thing, there's no way you could be a Church of Christ. What is this best Spanish Bible? The best Spanish Bible is the Valera 1602 Purified, much better than the Gomez, uh, much better than the 1865, very, very much better than 1960. Go to my website, thecloudchurch.org, and uh, right there on that website, somewhere I have the history of the Spanish Bible. And you can click on that video. It's almost two hours, but I show you which Bible is the best Spanish Bible. I show you the history of the Spanish Bible. And how the right Bible is the Valera 1602 Purified Bible, the closest to the King James. Uh, it's called the Valera 1602 Purified. Will you ever go to Israel and preach? I don't know. I've, I've never wanted to go to Israel because it's all desert. If I ever go to Israel, and this might sound bad, the only reason I'd want to go to Israel is for the food. I have come to the realization that I really like uh, Mediterranean food. I didn't A couple years ago, I had no idea what hummus was. And uh, we went to a Greek restaurant one time and I tried hummus for the first time. And I said, man, where has this been my whole life? And my wife, she makes us hummus from time to time. And I, I've found that I like uh, gyros. Um, you know, the, some call it a gyro. That meat is so good. So if I do go to Israel, I'm, I would just want to find like, what's the best restaurant? But I've, you know, I've got my Bible. I know all about where those places are in Israel. Actually seeing them might be fun, but it just, it doesn't look like a fun place. It's all desert. And I know I'll see it in the, in the millennium. So why do I need to go now? 
Um, thank you for your sermons online. You're welcome. Do you believe curses, witchcraft, or hexes? Like I could burn you just by focusing on your forehead. Yeah, I think people can do that through witchcraft and dem demons. But if you're a child of God, I don't see how they could do that to you. Um, did Paul, Paul teach communism like we see in Peter and Acts? No, no, he did not. Paul did not preach communism. Paul had his own business. And uh, under communism, you're not allowed to be a business owner. Paul was a tent maker. He had his own business. Who was a reprobate? Well, um, don't have time to get into that. Do you believe in time travel? Yes, I do. We have just traveled through two hours of time. So I believe in time travel, but I believe it works one way. You travel from the past to the future. <laughs> I don't see how you can go back, but I do believe we've all gone forward together for the last two hours. So, yes. Um, Robert Breaker, a Ruckmanite, although he was divorced three times and unqualified. Yeah, we're not going to get into the life of Peter Ruckman. But if you want to talk about a man who's been married more than once and say we shouldn't follow that man because he's been married more than once. OK, then we need to take the book of the law. Take your Bible, cut out the first five books of the Bible, because Moses was married three times, if we want to follow an argument like that. Men are sinners. We're all sinners. The Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And if God called Peter Ruckman to be a Bible teacher, and that's what I think he was, that's what I view him as, he was one of the best Bible teachers I've ever known, then he, that's a gift that God gave him. And... Uh, and he did that. Now, I, I would debate with you if Peter Ruckman was a pastor. I don't think he was a pastor. Um, a pastor is someone who's there for his people and cares about him. And you could never approach Ruckman. You know, you go to his office and say, I need to talk to you, pastor. He'd say, go over there and talk to that guy. So I never saw Ruckman much as a pastor. I saw him as one of the greatest Bible teachers in the world. I'm not going to attack the guy. I was there. I saw the things that happened to him. His wives ran off and left him. We live in a very evil Evil dispensation, an evil time. In the Bible, a woman can't just up and leave her husband and divorce him. But in the world in which we live today, they can and they do. And I find that very sad. And oftentimes, the man can't do anything. It's very sad. So I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to talk bad about Ruckman. If you want to, you help yourself. But I think it's very sad to personally attack a person and what he's been through in his life. And those are things that the devil brought against him. Someone asked, are you baptized? Yeah. Um, uh, I can't understand that one. Have any truly saved people received the stigmata? And I'm not certain what the stigmata is. I think it might be their arms, their hands bleed and their face. And I don't see that that's a Christian thing. To me, that's demons doing that to people. What are your thoughts on the flowing oil Bible from Dalton, Georgia? People have asked me about that. And I, I just, my question is, where's that in the Bible? I don't see in the Bible where the Bible says anything about a Bible, you open it up and oil flows out. So I'm not going to go there. I don't know what to do with that. I don't even, it makes no sense to me. So I don't go there. Um, you want to talk about the unforgivable sin? I do not. Uh, let's talk about that. If you get a chance, look up my YouTube video, What is the Sin of Blasphemy? And that will explain what that so-called unforgivable sin is and how you cannot do the sin of blasphemy today. That is only for a certain time in a certain dispensation. Um, I'm a member of the Church of Christ, member of the former SDA, Seventh-day Adventist. Could you do a video on why I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist? Yes, I will try to do that sometime. I would like to do that in this setting uh, because someone has contacted me not too long ago and said that they were a former SDA and that they might know much more about it than I do. And maybe together we can talk about why the Seventh-day Adventists are so messed up. Um, let's see, anything else here? Someone says, is masturbation a sin? Hmm. Okay, let's don't go there, but think about it. If you do that and you're not married, what are you thinking about? If you're a man, you're probably thinking about a woman. You're probably using pornography. That would be lusting in your heart after someone you're not married to, and that would be wrong. So yes, that is a sin. Think about it. What if I told you your lights will go out in 10 minutes? Okay, well, that's great. I don't know why you would think that. Are you standing outside the door and you're going to cut them? I hope not. I uh, just want you to know I've got my pistol on me. So uh, if you're coming over to hurt me, then that'll be on you. Um, I do believe in the right to self-defense. So if my uh, lights go out in 10 minutes, you better not come in. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, what else here? Well, down to the to the bottom here. Um, Robert Breaker, if you have a question. Okay. That's about it. I don't see any more questions. Thank you so much for your teaching on the 70th week of Daniel. You're welcome. Um, so 
I don't see any more questions. Robert Breaker, are you baptized? How do we know through the blood, not water, but you are baptized? After I got saved, I got baptized in water. To me, it was no big deal because it has nothing to do with our salvation. Um, so I, you know, I don't focus in on water baptism because to me, you know, eh, whatever. But um, after you're saved, you can get water baptized if you want. But again, don't think that that saves you or keeps you saved or has anything to do with salvation. Um, can you talk about woman's hair and the angels? I've talked about that in our verse by verse Bible study through Corinthians. Um, did Adam have a belly button? <laughs> Probably not. God created him. Now, he might have created him with one, though, because everybody else after would have one. But uh, I wasn't there, so I didn't know. What if I told you eight more minutes? I am from the future. I would say, well, good for you. Have fun in the future. And uh, please send me the winning lottery ticket uh, for tomorrow so that I can uh, get some money. And <laughs> no, uh, let's see. Uh, One million dollars for your beard. Whatever. Um, King James only. Why Robert Breaker? Uh, watch my video on why King James only. Do you believe in an alternative cosmology? I do not. Uh, so many questions and so many off topic. I was hoping people would have questions about this. I guess people already know all that. Do you receive donations regarding information points us to the right direction toward God? Okay. Again, check the website. You can find out more. Thank you for preaching. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, the lottery is rigged in a scam. Yeah, I, I understand. That was a joke. Uh, some people don't understand uh, when you make a joke nowadays, but that was a joke about the lottery. My dad is stuck in the Church of Christ. Can you please make a video so I show him about why it's not true? Well, the one that's coming out for this Sunday is entitled Paul's Message. That would be an excellent message to show him that it's not the water baptism that saves, which they are so stuck on. It is Paul's message. And we're almost done. I think we need to call this quits because my my kids are out there. And now it's about time for us to have a very late dinner here. So any more questions? How do we debunk, debunk replacement theology? I've got some videos on that, all about you know the Jews and how God's not done with the Jews. And uh, I think they were toward the end of last year where I talk a little bit about the Jews. Uh, and the Bible debunks replacement theology. And one of the greatest ways to debunk replacement theology is the fact that Israel is a nation again. <laughs> and replacement theology says there's no such thing as the Jews. God's done with them. And so, you know, but yet... Why are they back and why is there the nation of Israel again? Hello. So, yeah, I think it's already been debunked. Thank you for teaching. I was stuck in the Catholic Church for 35 years. Yeah, you're welcome. And I'm glad you got the truth. And I'm going to tell you, some of the best Christians are those that got saved out of the Catholic Church. Because when they get the truth, they get so thankful because they were in a cult. And now they get out and they get saved and they make some of the best Christians because they realize all those years they had been taught a lie. And now they want more people to get saved and they go out and try to tell others how to be saved. So if you know a Catholic, try to tell them the truth. Thank you for your sermons. You're welcome. All right. Well, I'm going to cut it off there. I do not see any more. And I'm tired. I did my best. I feel like I'll sleep well tonight, though, because I wanted to get that out there. And I hope, I hope that you understand. True church, false church. And I hope that if anything else, you'll understand the Catholic church is not the church of God. It's not the church that Christ founded. It is a church that in 325 AD separated from the true line of the church. And it's been set up and it's one of the most corrupt, evil, wicked things that have ever existed on this earth. And how many people have been murdered? and killed and, and just oh it's so horrible so horrible so please get people the truth that's about it i'm going to cut her off there uh, thank you for watching next week we'll have a special guest so tune in for that i'm gonna have to have my headphones on when i have a guest don't know if i'll use the whiteboard next week maybe we will but uh, hopefully we'll have a good time next week as well thank you for for watching god bless you here we go again that's what we got up there if you want a screenshot and we'll see you next week Goodbye. Yep, end.